Hello and welcome all to the concluding part of our two-day conference. The title of this virtual session is Real and Imagined Geographies. We have here today Dr. Rakhi Ghosh as our chairperson for this session. She is an associate professor of the Department of English in Ramakrishna Sharada Mission Vivekananda Vidya Bhavan. Her PhD thesis focuses on the 18th century English women novelists. Her areas of interest include gender studies, Indian writing in English. Rakhidi will be the chairperson of this very interesting session. Rakhidi, over to you. Okay, so the first speaker that we have in this session that is titled Real and Imagined Geographies. We have uh, Kathleen Lukoveni, who is a senior lecturer at the Department of English Studies of Kyoto Flora University, Budapest, Hungary. She received her PhD in English and American Literature in 2014. The Hungarian book version of her dissertation in English is Irony, Self Irony, and Humor in 20th Century Jewish American Literature, and that was published in 2018. And presently, she is doing her research on the Hungarian-born English poet and literary translator George Zertis. Apart from her academic career, she also works as a poet, editor, and a literary translator. As an editor, she has specialized in books for children. Two books edited by her have won the Hungarian Children's Book of the Year Award in 2018 and 2019. And, uh, and then Kathleen, uh, will you please uh, start your paper now? Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for organizing this conference. Uh, and thank you also for the introduction. Um, let me just share my PPT with you and please confirm if you can see it. Just a second. can't see my PPT yet, unfortunately. Like it's open, but um, it doesn't offer in this um, window to, to share it. Yesterday it, it worked. You have that share option coming? On your yeah, I, I clicked on the share option and but the... Apparently I, I don't seem to be offered. Uh, the PPT option. Let me just uh, close it and open it once again. Maybe it will notice it now. Um, sorry about the technical issues. Always we have that when we go online. Um, still, not. the only only thing it, it offers is the stream uh, window itself, the Google window. Um, do you also have my PPT, maybe? Shuchatana, do you have Kathleen's PPT? Can anybody share it? Have you have you already shared it? I can I can quickly run it on. If you uh, have of already course, I sent it, it sent it to you. I don't know two weeks ago or so. Okay, okay. Let me check and let me run it. Oh, Thank okay. you. I'm sorry about this. It, it did work yesterday. These are technical glitches. No, that can happen at any point of time. I'm gonna try to share the only window that I see, but that, that's equal to the to the um, screen that I think all of you see. That's not what I'd like to share. You see, that's the only window I can I can share with you the stream, which is not good. Kathleen Doita is saying, are you using Google Chrome? Yes. Yeah, and okay. the irritating thing is that it did work yesterday at the trial okay, session. Okay, okay, okay. So, so I, I haven't changed anything on my part. Just a minute, it's already done. Yeah. 
this is to open and check whether it works for me here as well. Asha, Catalina, can you see the message that is said on the screen? Uh, now know. I'm reading it. Uh, upload file option instead. Where is the upload file option? Or, or uh, Catalina, there is another message. You can select the entire screen share option. And then can okay. anyone see it? Can anyone see? Uh, I'm, I, I try to do that. I try to share the entire screen. Okay. okay. Is my uh, is it visible or Akidi? No, no, no. Your PPT is not visible still. Okay. Now, now I'm now. sharing the entire screen, but you can't. Can you see my PPT now? No, no, no. Okay. Yes. Now I can see. Now I. Can. Okay. Yes. Then we can actually start. Thank you so much for your patience and sorry about this inconvenience with the PPT. Uh, as I mentioned, the title of my presentation is In the Land of the Giants, Poetry for Children by George Sirtis or Sirtes. Uh, he's an English poet, but Hungarian born. Uh, for that reason, his name has two pronunciations. The English version is uh, Sirtis and the Hungarian version is, version is Sirtes and he uses both depending on the context in which he is. Um, let me say a few words about the author whose books uh, I'm going to discuss a bit more uh, to make you understand why I felt it relevant to this particular conference. He was born in 1948 in Budapest, the capital of Hungary, and at the age of eight, uh, he moved uh, with his family, his parents and his younger brother, uh, to London uh, because we had a revolution against uh, the invading Soviet troops in Budapest, and many, many people fled the country, uh, especially to the West. So they settled down in, uh, in the UK, uh, in England, uh, 30s, graduated in art in Leeds and London, started his career as a um, visual artist and as a um, publisher and teacher of fine art. And then in uh, 1979, he published his first collection of poetry, The Slammed Door, which proved to be very successful. It received the Faber Memorial Prize uh, for, uh, and then uh, he's been published. He has published about uh, 24 um, um, independent volumes since then. Now, um, in the mid 80s, the Cold War between uh, the East and the West uh, was throwing up. And as part of that process, he was able to uh, come to Hungary for longer stays, first uh, uh, supported by the British Council. And this is where he rediscovered his mother tongue. Up to that point, he was uh, uh, exclusively writing in English, but from the end of the 1980s, he's been uh, also working as a translator of Hungarian literature into English. He started with translating the Hungarian classical, The Tragedy of Man by Imre Madács, for which he received a, a prestigious Hungarian uh, translation prize. And uh, then, uh, again, he's been producing one translation after the other, which have been uh, acknowledged by uh, several international awards um, uh, in the US for uh, Laszlo Krasna Horka's uh, Shatan Tango, or the European Poetry Translation Prize, and so on. I'm mentioning all this biographical data because all these will be relevant uh, in his uh, three books that I will discuss more in later more in detail later. Uh, okay, and um, as I mentioned, uh, he also had a teaching career. He started um, in a, a middle and high school, and then uh, he started uh, teaching creative writing first at the Norwich School of Art and Design, and later at the University of East Anglia, which is basically the most prestigious and longest established um, university in the UK, which deals with creative writing. Uh, the final uh, book that I like to mention by him is the James Tate Black Prize for the Photographer at 16, which is a biographical uh, novel about his mother, who was a Jewish uh, Holocaust survivor moving from Transylvania through Budapest to London. And uh, her uh, life story allows uh, Sirtis to reflect on basically all the major historical events uh, in Europe during the 20th century. So that is the background in which he uh, wrote and, and got published his three books for children. 
you can see the front covers here and I'm going to proceed in a chronological order, although the title of my presentation is in the middle or comes from the book in the middle and also that's the most successful one because that's the one which received the CLPE Children's Poetry Award. Um, it's now called the Clip of the Center for Literacy and Primary Poetry Award, which is the only um, um, award for uh, collections of uh, children's poetry uh, in the UK. So the first book is the Red All Over Riddle book, which was illustrated by Andrew Stook and it was published in 1997. The second was in the Land of the Giants, uh, which was illustrated by the author's daughter, Helen Surtis. And the third uh, collection is How to Be a Tiger, uh, which was uh, illustrated by Tim Archbold and uh, it was published in 2017. I deliberately mention uh, the names of the uh, illustrators as well because um, partly uh, um, the visual uh, component of uh, books is really important for Sirtis himself. As I said, he used to work as a visual artist. Uh, partly, uh, illustrations are very important for uh, children's books in general. Uh, if you re can uh, recall uh, how Lewis Carroll starts Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, in the very first paragraph, there's a sentence like, what is the use of a book, thought Alice, without pictures? And I think that's still very typical of uh, children's book industry, that illustrations uh, mean a lot for children. So let me just uh, speak first about the Red All Over Riddle book, which contains uh, 49 riddles, uh, which is a surprising number because it's so close to uh, 50, which would be a nice round number, that when you check the list of solutions and you see 49, you might think why the author didn't make the effort to make it round. Uh, and actually he did. The 50th riddle is in the title itself, uh, it's based on one of the best known uh, English riddles, the joking question, what's black and white and red all over? And the answer is a newspaper. Of course, this riddle is based on the homophones red, the color, as spelled on the front cover, and red, the past participle form of the verb uh, to read. Uh, and this is a very well-known riddle. Uh, Sirtis makes use of it, but also transforms it significantly, partly by replacing newspaper by book, and even more by integrating the solution, the answer to the riddle, within the question or within the puzzling statement. So that way he gets rid of the obvious structure of the riddle, making it even more a riddle, even more puzzling for the reader. And the third component uh, misleading or, or puzzling the, the reader is, of course, the cover itself, which is red all over, even with matchstick uh, figures painting the book, red all over. So uh, very early, right at the beginning of the book, or even before opening the book, uh, we can see that this is a very playful book. Uh, that uh, it's not just a descriptive title, which it has, uh, explaining the reader that it'll, it will be a book of riddles, but it's a performative title. It actually performs a riddle. Um, and um, also it calls attention to the uh, importance of illustrations, which will be extremely important all through the book. And this is what my next slide is about. Uh, all these three illustrations are taken uh, from uh, the Red All Over Riddle book. Uh, some, uh, as I said, um, and the Oxford English Reference Dictionary defines riddle as a question or statement, testing ingenuity in dividing its answer or meaning. So we always have a question or a puzzling statement, and we look for an answer or solution. And of course, the illustrations help to find a solution in various ways. If you take a look at the left-hand side uh, uh, example, um, I'm going to read it, it's really brief. Here come the angels, like very loud tourists wielding their cameras with built-in flashes, brightening dark weather. 
And the solution to this uh, uh, misleading description is lightning, which is actually written on the page, but not in print, but in handwriting under the ban. I hope you can see. So in some of the pictures, you get the written solution as part of the picture. A version of this solution you can observe in the middle picture, where the solution is apple tree, but it's slightly different from the previous one that it's not really a distinct word in itself, but the letters of the word apple tree are forming the branches and the twigs of the apple tree in the drawing, actually. So it's, a, it's probably a more sophisticated uh, clue for the solution. Whereas in the third type of uh, uh, clues provided by uh, the graphics um, is what my right hand example is about. Let me read that again. Behold a dual monarchy ruling over cutlery. One's a school, the other school, but how the tears come pouring down when you twist that fancy crown. So again, this is a puzzling uh, description of something, but if you take a look at the page, it's very obvious that the something to be uh, identified are the two taps, uh, and it, they are visually very obvious and clear in the page. So uh, the visual component is collaborating with the textual component, uh, motivating the young reader to decipher both texts and, and uh, pictures, offering a, a kind of a very brief, very uh, funny and entertaining introduction to uh, both the, the textual and the verbal and the visual components uh, of our culture. The other thing that I'd like to point out about this book is that it focuses on language. It highlights that language is not just a transparent means of communication, but it's a challenge that needs to be overcome. It's a, it's a riddle that needs to be solved. And there are people who uh, possess the solutions and there are people, the children, or people who are learning the language that need to find the solution, that need to learn how to find the solution, which uh, to me indicates a parallel state of mind between children and between uh, the child refugee uh, who the author uh, used to be at the age of eight when he landed in uh, the UK, didn't know a word of English, and had to adopt it as a second language and had to face the, the riddles of language day by day. And this is a very important theme for him. Uh, he reflects on that abundantly in his poetry, for example, in his poem, The Drowned Girl, which he published and republished in numerous uh, volumes. For example, it is the introductory uh, poem, so in a very prominent position in his collection, The Budapest File, uh, which is a, his collection focusing on his Hungarian heritage. And there he describes in this poem, The Drowned Girl, how he was struggling with the pronunciation of typical English sounds like the and th and w, which do not exist in Hungarian, how he mastered monosyllabic words first, and then he adds, these were the words I learned, these were and are the words that I now teach my children. So uh, very often, uh, language and language acquisition is placed in the context of succeeding generations. Uh, either in the biography about his mother, about how they were Englishing themselves, it's deliberately uh, an unusual or maybe non-existing word, and also in the context of Riddles, which is a book uh, for children. Uh, apart from um, uh, Riddles uh, revealing language as a challenge, uh, that can be solved. Uh, riddles are also based on ambiguity. And ambiguity, we know it since Simpson's uh, Seven Types of Ambiguity, are a fertile ground of poetry, the very basis of uh, poetry. Uh, so ambiguity appears in uh, this book in numerous forms, in simple puns, uh, in, in uh, the form of uh, dead metaphors revived, like in the poem about ballpoint pen, 
where uh, Sirte is right, so thin and straight and tall and always on the ball, on the ball meaning to be alert to new ideas. So it's kind of um, rediscovering the dead metaphor uh, behind this idiom. Or in the anthropomorphism uh, of numerous inanimate uh, phenomena like electricity, uh, which starts like, I know a man, he lives in the wall, and then goes on describing electricity as if it was a man. Uh, so what I'm trying to point out with these uh, types of ambiguity uh, is that, uh, once again, this book offers a very brief and, and very fun introduction to uh, the various um, poetic devices and uh, also to the various uh, uh, possible cooperation between uh, visual and textual elements. Okay, let me say a few words about the second volume. Uh, this will be briefer and the third will be even a lot briefer. That will be just uh, two sentences, I guess. So, in the land of the giant is uh, special in many respects. Uh, that's the middle book and that's the award-winning uh, book. Uh, one is that it was illustrated by uh, Sertes's own uh, daughter. <clears throat> and let me just read the entry from his blog, uh, which was written around the publication of the poem, <clears throat> uh, the book. There was a set of about 50 tiny drawings made by our daughter, Helen, when she was just nine or ten. I can't quite remember where she made them. It might have been at home or it might have been on one of our longest days in Budapest in the 80s. They were extraordinary pieces of characterization, very sophisticated for her years, each wanting to speak. So I wrote a poem for each of them. So in the middle cycle of this book, the only cycle where we have illustrations, uh, the illustrations actually preceded uh, the text, which accompanied the illustrations later or the drawings later. And also, I think it's exceptional because they were illustrations produced by a child herself. Uh, what I said about the parallel uh, state of mind between a refugee child that Sertes used to be and the child puzzled by the world uh, appears here as well. Uh, in the poem that gave the title of the collection, uh, the child is in the land of giants, uh, in a land which is magical and full of magical and at the same time slightly threatening creatures. And this is what I wanted to highlight, that the concept of the world of adults as the world of giants, both amazing and threatening, is an idea that belongs very much to Hungarian ch children's literature. Uh, it's uh, been uh, phrased like that by Lurin Sabo, one of the mid 20th century Hungarian uh, poets, who has been translated by Sirtes. Some, some uh, 10 poems by him have been translated by him, and who wrote quite a few poems about his son or to his son, one of them being Lorty Grows Sky High. And let me just quote briefly from this. You can see it on the right-hand side. I was quarreling with my young one as a giant might with an elf. Look, you don't hammer the furniture. Where are you going? Behave yourself. So it's a parental fight with the young son, Lutzi, in which the author reflects to himself as a giant. And accordingly, at the end of the poem, he squats down, realizes how amazing and threatening uh, the adult world might seem to a small child. So I lifted him up high, the poor thing, so he could be a giant too. Um, the very same concept that the world is amazing and threatening at the same time also appears in another poem by him, which tells about his own first visit to Debrecen, a Hungarian town where the family moved. Uh, and the young Lurins Sabo recalls this memory in his poem Debrecenben. Uh, he takes a walk and he sees a trade sign of a clockmaker, which he misreads for a giant. In Hungarian, the two words, clockmaker Uras and giant Uriás, are very close to each other. There's just one letter difference between them. So the being impressed by the adult world as the world of giants is very much um, 
a motive that Sirtesh might have uh, learned from the Hungarian children's literature or might have discovered for himself. Either way, uh, it tells about this strange feeling of being a foreigner in a world, uh, which I said is uh, an experience in Sirtis' own childhood, as well as his own uh, children's experience when the family started to revisit Hungary in the late 80s, when, when his children were about the same age. Um, okay, and the final book that I'd like to say, uh, sorry, uh, one more thing about this one, which is really peculiar, that he integrated some of his own translation from Hungarian children's poetry into the book, which is a practice not very usual in English uh, book industry. It does uh, appear in some of his collections, poetry collections for adults, uh, especially in the 90s, early 2000s, when after the Cold War, all Western Europe was excited about the previous or the former uh, Soviet bloc. And it does appear in this collection, um, which is quite an exceptional uh, phenomenon, I suppose. Uh, so finally, the third book, How to Be a Tiger, is um, a chronological develop, uh, is following the chronological uh, development of growing up from being born to through getting acquainted with your body uh, to going to school and it uses many of the poetic devices already put into use in the other two books uh, puns and ambiguities here you can see an example from this book uh, which is concrete poetry where the topo topographical arrangement of the lines uh, imitate the movement of the swing which the text describes and um, this uh, book uh, actually names uh, some of the children, some of his Sirtis' grandchildren, Marley and uh, Lucas. So um, uh, it's again uh, imagined and created in a family context. So as a conclusion, I'd like to say that combining the English tradition of nonsense poetry and puns with the international tradition of riddles and translation of Hungarian poetry, Sirtis provides his young readers and listeners with ample variety in poetic genres and forms. Some of the, his riddles may be set in parallel with his poems for adults, recalling his own bewilderment of language as an eight-year-old refugee starting to learn English, while some others bear the influence of his work as a translator of Hungarian literature. In each of the three books, there is a strong connection between the verbal content and the graphics, especially in The Land of the Giants, producing collaboration with his daughter as an illustrator. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope I can step out from sharing my screen. Have I managed to? Yes. Uh, thank you, Kathleen, for your presentation. And uh, it was really, uh, uh, there was a, uh, such a lot of insight that you provided through your paper. That is how we were sort of looking upon the different books for children and how the riddle books, for example, and how answers were also there in the riddle. And then you also talked about how language can become some kind of a puzzle. And that was so very interesting. And then in the second and the third book, that is from the point of view of the child, from the perspective of the child, how the adult world, how a child looks at an adult world and he realizes that it is something that is so very unfamiliar with. So uh, really uh, such an insightful paper. And uh, maybe uh, I think we will be uh, doing the discussions after all the speakers have finished with their papers. So the question answer session, I think we will be doing at the end. Um, and with that, I think we can sort of move over to the next paper uh, by Doita De. And uh, now Doita De, she is a uh, faculty at the Department of English, Ramakrishna Sharada Mission, Vivekananda Vita Bhavan. And her areas of interest are children's literature popular culture, post-colonialism, and gender. Apart from teaching, she has also worked as a correspondent come copy editor for the Economic Times and as documentation officer for Anjali, a mental health rights organization. 
She has worked in freelance capacity as writer and editor for various media groups, including BBC Africa. She is currently preparing for her doctoral research on Shokuji Prize fictional works. So with that, uh, Doita, we move over to your paper. And can you please start by announcing the title of your paper? Yes, um, a very good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Ghosh, for the introduction. Uh, can I just share my uh, paper? Uh, can you see? Is it visible? Yes, it's just coming. Yes, yes, now it's visible. OK. Um, <clears throat> so my paper um, is titled On Board to Take on the World, Role of Boarding School Stories in Pre-Adolescent and Adolescent Literature. Um, school uh, <clears throat> plays a pivotal role in pre-adolescent and adolescent stages of our lives. And uh, we can all agree um, that school is the prime site for the threats or to go through uh, you know the tests of pre-adulthood uh, that help us in um, you know that helped in teaching all of us uh, certain basic life lessons as preparation to go out in the world mm, we learn to work under authority outside family uh, and navigate peer dynamics um, and in that uh, school has not just been an important uh, social institution that imparted education uh, to us as young individuals, but became an important site of our empowerments and repressions. No doubt then uh, that school stories have been a compelling setting in pre-adolescent and adolescent literature. And yet when we say school story, it mainly refers to boarding school stories. Uh, the earliest kind of school stories um, that emerged in England in the second half of the 18th century uh, were the single sex boarding school stories. And uh, critics have since found reasons to refer to stories set in boarding schools as school story. Now, as we see here, um, boarding schools uh, down the ages and across uh, various genres have been the most fascinating scaffolding to frame stories of complicated uh, pre-adolescent or adolescent challenges and how to deal with them all by one's uh, self. A school setting in itself throws children together to explore friendship, conflicts and everything in between on their own. Um, but a boarding school not just extends uh, such adventure 24-7, but without the scope for the family to intervene in everyday transactions and interactions or be available um, at any time for support, uh, emotional or physical, they enable the ch children to be at the center of their own stories. And this um, allows the young reader to vicariously explore one's place and power independently and understand the nuances of responsibility that comes with independence. Uh, this paper, uh, that is a work in progress, will explore the diverse scopes of the boarding school setting in pre-adolescent and adolescent literature. The boarding school uh, stories as isolated worlds become powerful tools in the hands of the adult authors to help shape the identities of young readers um, when they are seeking independence and uh, curious about what lies ahead. Seeing school as an ideological state apparatus, the people would want to argue that boarding school becomes a compelling setting to introduce pre-adolescents and adolescents to the idea of a central authority, that is the state, and its numerous ramifications, the state apparatuses, that need to be negotiated and navigated for survival and fitting in the adult world. Uh, the paper will probe how boarding school setting can also be seen as potential means to create 
a disciplinary subject for the future, following Foucault's ideas of panoptic surveillance. And <coughs> simultaneously, sorry, <coughs> it will also explore how such setting <coughs> has carnival departures that allows its young readers to indulge in a world um, that Buck in flames is opposed to that one-sided and gloomy official seriousness, which is dogmatic and hostile to evolution and change, and which he, uh, Bakhtin thinks that uh, seeks to absolutize a given condition of existence or a given social order. And indeed, uh, by engaging um, in, the, in the culture of laughter, often through anti-establishment humor and rebellion in such stories, the young readers are able to make peace with their pent up uh, repressions in real life and reconcile with the powers looming over them. So the underlying aim, either way, uh, be it through the idea of Foucault's panoptic surveillance or Bakhtin's carnivalist, is to create future adults who have evolved from being defiant, rebellious, and reckless individuals uh, to compliant or at least flexible and more cautious players in negotiating their position in the larger scheme of things. And finally, the paper will examine how such secluded, often somewhat intimidating and self-contained worlds aid in introducing higher ideals of belonging and loyalty to these young individuals. Now, a boarding school is a perfect microcosm, if we see, of the world at large. And a, a young reader can find a veritable space in these books to explore and accustom uh, to events and concerns that call for power, responsibilities, and social tactics to deal with them. Um, while explaining ideology, uh, James Kavana, in his essay, Ideology, suggests that the term designates a rich system of representations worked up in specific material practices which helps form individuals into social subjects who freely internalize an appropriate picture of their social world and their place in it. <clears throat> now, school, as uh, Louis Althusser identifies, is an important ideological state apparatus. Um, and, and the boarding school uh, further also serves as a surrogate family. Uh, and family is also identified by Althusser as another ISA. Um, moreover, uh, like any other school, the boarding school also often works in tandem with the other ideological state apparatus, that is the religion. And the education it imparts is almost always a political act and not a neutral enterprise. Now, um, Going by uh, Roberta Slinger Trites, uh, Trites' assertion in her book, uh, Disturbing the Universe, Power and Repression in Adolescent Literature, um, we can all agree that uh, school is the first place, um, or one of the first places, where a kid encounters questions on sexuality, gender, race, uh, class, and um, cultural mores surrounding death. Now, the boarding school then is a perfect setting to initiate a child gradually into these social forces as she or he treads into that liminal space between childhood and adulthood, exploring identities and trying to ascertain which one uh, suits her or him the best. Uh, and fending for oneself against um, other kids uh, or institutional power in a rigorous on-campus life, uh, boarding school stories also allow its young readers to concentrate on the growth curve of not one, but quite a few children and their uh, tenacity, grit, fortitude to deal with such social forces. So the reader uh, has more options from the different characters in such a uh, school setting to identify with and who in turn allegorically teach them to deal with the same forces in their own world. <clears throat> now, if you follow what uh, uh, Judith Butler says and uh, see the boarding school as a seat uh, of myriad power struggles, 
uh, it can be said uh, that the boarding school setting then helps the adult author to school the young readers on how to socialize and explore and exploit their agency. Uh, thus, the boarding school stories can themselves be seen as part of institutional socialization um, for pre-adolescents and adolescents. Uh, in fact, the early uh, boarding school stories had a certain didactic aspect to them. And uh, even though um, the stories by the 20th century have ceased to be overtly didactic, uh, the underlying moral or message or um, uh, the insinuation through its uh, system of representations cannot be ignored. So um, while fables and fairy tales have encapsulated social values for children, uh, we can say that boarding school stories uh, replace them gradually in the preteen and teenage world um, adding value to their social agency through the yarns woven around them. Um, I'll take the example of Harry Potter, uh, the, uh, um, where Harry, Hermione, and Ron uh, begin by defying certain institutional orders, testing the extent of their own powers to defy and rebel, um, but end up being rescued always by the representatives of those same institutional powers. Um, they also learn in the due course that um, their defiance was somewhat orchestrated by higher authority, uh, either Dumbledore or Snape. So does that then deter them from rebellion or defiance? Uh, perhaps not. But they learn to defy and rebel with knowledge of the limits of their powers and accepting the inevitable power that social institutions have over individuals in every aspect of their lives. Now, coming to this suggestion of orchestration by uh, the, the high authority, um, or oftentimes even uh, the watchful eyes of peers who can anytime report to the authority, um, the idea is not very far from subtly suggesting Foucault's idea of panoptic surveillance. Um, and so it can be argued then that such tropes uh, may be deliberately used um, in such uh, literature to instill a disciplined reflex uh, amongst the young readers. And uh, within a boarding school setting, this idea of panoptic surveillance becomes more pronounced because in uh, a boarding school, the social forces become one composite force, um, almost similar uh, to the idea of state in the adult life. So as the characters in the boarding school experience the inevitability of authority and its all pervasiveness, um, it also suggests to the young readers an understanding that empowerment comes with its own limits but which can be distinguished from absolute repression. And so then we can also say that this allows the adult author to cultivate a future batch of productive force that is aware of its position and would at all times be alert to the kind of rebellion one is allowed and one that is proscribed. And um, you know this can perpetuate the existing power dynamics in a hegemony. Uh, now, interestingly, <clears throat> the world of boarding school, uh, despite suggestions of an omniscient authority, also alternately alludes to carnivalist departures uh, by feeding the young minds ideas of rebellion and subverting the social order. But um, as uh, Roberta Sillinger Trites uh, points out, much of the humor and virtually all of the rebellion in adolescent novels about school rely on carnivalist departures from status quo to lull the adolescent into eventually embracing it. So by providing for an emotional outlet, anti-establishment humor helps teenagers reconcile themselves to living with the establishment. Um, 
uh, Bakhtin, uh, while talking about his, uh, 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 describing his carnivalist crowd, um, also says that the individual feels that he is an indissoluble part of the collectivity, a member of the people's mass body. Now, in the first place, this whole idea uh, in, in the boarding school of living together with friends and teachers and sharing the personal space and being able to break rules at all odd hours and rebel against not just teachers, but peers and seniors anytime, invariably kind of triggers a carnival association in the minds of the readers. Uh, and then the teachers and seniors often relinquish their positions of power to become friends in personal space or stand as direct antagonists in such stories. Uh, so this also blurs the lines of authority and subordination and offers um, alternative construction of social relations, mm, almost in a true, like, just like a, a true carnival sense. Um, further, in seeing oneself as the indissoluble part of the collectivity, uh, the young protagonist is forced to perceive the wider impact of one's rebellion or defiance. Uh, and as a consequence, learns to take action for the collective good and advances toward uh, maturity from selfish insubordination or nonconformity uh, to more cautious rebellion uh, within establishment rules and for greater causes. Uh, I'll again uh, use the example of uh, Harry Potter here because uh, time, time constraint. Um, it, this is the uh, most uh, known uh, story. So if we, if we see, Harry is simultaneously repressed under the lights of Snape or um, Umbridge and uh, liberated by his friendship with Hagrid, Professor Lupin uh, and Dumbledore. Uh, and while he begins by rebelling all, against almost all authorial instructions um, uh, and um, as we see uh, along with Ron and Hermione, often loses house points for breaking rules, um, uh, you know, for personal inquisitiveness, uh, if he may say so, uh, he gradually learns to rebel for greater causes and do so within rules more cautiously. Um, also, his antagonism with Professor Quirrell or uh, coming to the rescue of his teacher turned friends, uh, Hagrid or Lupin, um, or reducing Lockhart into a comic caricature. Um, and even uh, Fred and George's hilarious pranks against Dolores Umbridge, all of these remind us of uh, Carnival's subversion. And uh, the subversiveness can be seen as a release for these youngsters from their feelings of social restraint, uh, what Freud uh, asserts as the purpose of humor, uh, and that that helps these young characters and in turn the young readers to reconcile with authority more freely and uh, more willingly. And there is no denying that the boarding school setting of Hogwarts allows such friendships and antagonism with authority and provide the scope for such subversion more naturally and much better. Uh, also, situating the stories in boarding schools, when most children attend day schools, uh, even in the early days of the uh, emergence of this genre, somewhat move the setting from absolute reality to one that is imagined and aspired by the youngsters. Looking beyond the aspect of these boarding school uh, stories as secular allegories um, on power negotiation uh, with social forces, the pre-adolescents and adolescents enjoy this fantastic adventure where one can have autonomy over their lives um, without the banality of family and most importantly with um, friends constantly by their side and foes uh, sleeping next. It most definitely uh, feels like the life of an adult uh, and yet the problems and issues are relevant to their age. So, we can say that the boarding school setting then adumbrates the real world itself with imagination. Um, also, as we may notice, uh, most of the boarding schools of these stories are secluded from the humdrum of conventional neighborhoods and are consciously created as self-contained units, um, probably 
uh, with the intention to help foster a strong sense of community amongst those young readers. Um, also, as, uh, as we see here, the school structures are mostly imposing and intimidating in appearance and always uh, looming large as a symbolic presence at critical junctures of the stories. Uh, they stand as constant reminders to the young students of where they belong and what they represent. So the stories then can be said to subtly introduce the more complex ideas of belonging, allegiance and camaraderie at an age when identity formation um, starts taking shape. Isabel Quigley uh, suggests the student's religion, if he has one, is an unswerving loyalty to his house and school. So the stories then can be interpreted as initiation into ideas of loyalty, duty, devotion, and patriotism, you know, as the groundwork to understand the deeper implications of, uh, say, nation, nationhood, culture, home, identity as adults. Um, so the boarding school of the school stories are the liminal space themselves between reality and fantasy that fascinates the young readers uh, negotiating the territory between childhood and adulthood, dealing with the complexities of the emerging adult life. They find in these stories a metaphor of their reality and things to deal with it. Uh, it is obviously easier to look at the bitter truths lived by one every day uh, through the allegory of these stories. Um, also, the boarding school setting allows the adult author to be the schoolmaster to the truant preteens and teens and tame them to reconcile with authority and provide them the tools to handle power struggles. Uh, but we can also say that the setting also gives expression to the adult author's fantasy when he was the schoolboy. Um, I would just sum up um, with a few lines from Maya Angelou's poem, uh, Life Doesn't Frighten Me, and it goes something like this, uh, shadows on the wall, noises down the hall, life doesn't frighten me at all, bad dogs barking loud, big ghosts in a cloud, life doesn't frighten me at all, mean old mother goose lions on the loose, they don't frighten me at all, dragons breathing flame on my counterpane. That doesn't frighten me at all. And um, as it goes, it almost sets me to imagine a plucky pre-adolescent or a defined adolescent um, bracing to enter into the larger power dynamics of the world uh, and believing that they can take on the world uh, all by themselves, closing the door on family and denying the necessity uh, to make them privy to what's happening in their lives. And we can almost imagine, uh, you know, these lines, imagine the kid uh, drumming up the courage with these lines needed to uh, help live the fright and terror that comes with these stages. Um, and um, as we would catch the young characters uh, from the pages of the boarding school stories uh, fighting shadows of the past like Harry in Harry Potter or engaging in noises down the hall like uh, Charlotte and Jamie uh, in a study in Charlotte um, or trying to deal with the bad boys uh, such as of the real shul in the flying classroom or um, come across a mean old witch while trying to run away from an impending um, punishment like Mildred Hubble in The Worst Witch, uh, we can fairly add the refrain of Angelou's poem as an applause for them uh, after each of their formidable challenges are faced and dealt with, knowing that they go out into the big bad world a little less frightened, uh, a little more prepared to fight the shadows, ghosts, lions and dragons of adulthood. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Doita, for sort of taking us into the uh, fantastic world of the boarding schools and uh, how uh, in your paper we came to know about how the boarding schools uh, are responsible in a way for shaping up the identities of young mind and how the children in, uh, in the boarding school, that is the boarding school becomes some kind of microcosm for them and uh, they are when they are trying to cope up with the challenges of boarding school life, so unconsciously they also sort of prepare themselves to meet the challenges of the outside world, the big bad world outside. 
so that was such a very interesting paper and uh, so with that we will be moving over to the next paper but meanwhile uh, if there is anybody who have got question for Catalines as well as Doita's papers please type your questions in the chat box and at the end of this session uh, we will be having a discussion so with that we move over to the uh, again, the last paper that is there, the paper by Kanupriya uh, and uh, uh, the title of the paper, uh, Mapping India, Psychophysical Travel Narratives of Children in Select Indian Diasporic Children's Literature. And Kanupriya is a senior research fellow in the Department of English, Jamia Milia Islamia, New Delhi. She is currently working on her doctoral thesis on children's literature in English at Nation Building in post-colonial India. So, Kanupriya, now over to your paper. Thank you, ma'am. Am, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. And... Um, the title of my paper is Mapping India, Psychophysical Travel Narratives of Children in Select Indian Diasporic Children's Literature. Uh, so in this paper, I will be discussing three primary texts, uh, which are uh, the first one is Naming Maya by Uma Krishnaswamy. This was published in 2004. The second text is Pashmina by Nidhi Chanani. This was published in 2017. And the, uh, the other text is Monsoon Summer by Mitali Perkins, published in 2004. And I have taken up these three texts specifically because these come under the rubric of uh, diasporic texts, yet there is no uh, theme of nostalgia or non-belongingness or in-betweenness anywhere in these texts if we go through and uh, yet we will look at how these texts map India in the phases in the growing up phases of the protagonists that we will come across uh, so we'll go through all these three texts uh, in detail uh, obviously uh, in briefly uh, and then we look at the junctures at which uh, the lives of the protagonists change as they are within the spaces of uh, India and how they transform and change because of being physically in India. So these are all travel narratives. The first text that I will discuss is um, Monsoon Summer by Mitali Perkins. So the, the name of the protagonist here is Jasmine and uh, she's a young girl. Uh, she's also called Jazz by her friends and she lives in America and she is uh, a school girl over there. And her mother is Sara. Her, her mother's name is Sara who is an Indian and she was adopted by an American couple and she was living in an orphanage in India, in Pune, in India. And she was later adopted by an American couple, and so she landed to America. And uh, she married an, uh, a man, an Englishman, in uh, from her college. And then uh, they had two children. One is Jasmine. The other one is Eric, a young boy. So this entire story is uh, from the uh, point of view of Jasmine. And uh, Sarah, the mother of Jasmine, she gets. Uh, project sanctioned in India uh, in, during the summers that she has to go back to the orphanage and she has to build a clinic for the pregnant women uh, in the suburbs of uh, Pune. And she decides, Sara, the mother decides that the entire family should go there during summer. But uh, Jazz, Jasmine, as the uh, who is the protagonist, she is quite adamant that she doesn't want to go. There are two reasons why. One is that she dislikes India because the only image that she has of India is that it's a very poor country and with malnourished children all around. And secondly, she does not want to leave her country because of her love interest, Steve, uh, with 
whom she runs a small business apart from her school. So that is why she does not wish to go to India, but against the wishes, she has to go. And there, uh, once she lands uh, in India and she goes to Pune, she again witnesses the same thing that she knows about in India, the poor people, uh, uh, malnourished children all around the streets, beggars, uh, people staring at her, gazing at her just because she's an American. And because of that reason, she doesn't even want to go to the orphanage to meet people over there. And she chooses to go to an academy, a school uh, for her summer session. But uh, even there, she doesn't feel very comfortable. Although the girls over there are quite uh, they're quite hospitable, but she does not feel very comfortable. Now her life changes when she meets a girl, Danita, who is of her age. And this girl is uh, from the orphanage and she has come to work in the apartment where uh, Jazz and her family, they are living. And she has come to work as a social help. Now, uh, she befriends Danita and Danita is quite good in cooking. She also speaks English because uh, they are taught in the orphanage. And uh, so uh, uh, Jazz become good friends with her, with Danita. And she learns quite a lot from her. She learns cooking from her. She even discusses her secrets with her about Steve, about America, about schooling. And then uh, she gets to know that Danita has two other sisters who are living in the orphanage. And she has to leave the orphanage according to the rules at the age of 18. But she does not want to leave her sisters. So she either has to marry someone or who will accept her along with her sisters or she has to work as a school teacher where she can also take care of her sisters so she is uh, danita is going with the first option where she is uh, has got a proposal from a, a man who is double the age of her and uh, he's willing to take uh, Daita along with her sisters but uh, jazz does not want her to do that and she discovers that danita is quite a good uh, she's quite good at stitching and she stitches various uh, dress materials and bags from the materials that uh, the the orphanage had got in donation from somewhere and she decides to help her establish her business she also gives her anonymous money uh, as a loan um, which danita is not aware of so uh, it's it's a two-way thing she helps danita and along with that she estab uh, jazz establishes that self-confidence because she was very insecure about her body her well-built body uh, and danita helps her build that confidence that she looks beautiful she looks beautiful in salwar kameez and she can dance she also learns kathak from danita then she learns to cook from her and finally she uh, jazz is able to express her feelings and uh, Steve also reciprocates her feelings. So in that way, finally, uh, after the summer is over, they leave and they go back to America. So uh, she was so adamant on coming to India because uh, she was uh, not very happy about the country whatever, from whatever she had learned. But finally, she goes back with beautiful memories. More than that, she has transformed herself completely. Now, uh, we later see discuss uh, some of the basic themes uh, from all the three texts. I'll briefly touch the second text, and that is um, Pashmina. And this is written by Nidhi Chanani. And here, there's a young girl, Priyanka Das. She lives in America. And she lives with her mother, a single mother. And she is not aware of who her father is. And she keeps on questioning her mother, but her mother uh, does not answer her and she talks about something else all the time so she's very curious to know about her family and her father and she wins a comic context where she gets some money and she decides to go to India but her mother does not allow her so she discovers a pashmina shawl in the uh, closet of her mother and once she wears that shawl uh, she gets a vision of India all the time and a very interesting part of this book is, is this is a picture book that only uh, the visions of India is uh, pictured or is colored 
uh, in different various colors whereas uh, the other parts of the story where uh, the american culture or american day to day life is uh, described it's all black and white only the indian part is uh, all colorful once she wears that pashmina she gets the vision of india and then she decides to go there and finally uh, she gets a letter from her masi from her aunt who calls her to india and she goes alone her mother doesn't go and there she discovers the story of this pashmina which was stitched or uh, by a woman in 1944 in warangal and uh, this was uh, an instruction by the goddess herself who wanted uh, to empower the woman so once uh, the anyone wears this pashmina they get a vision of what they should do next in their lives and that is a way of empowering so uh, her priyanka's mother had got from her mother and finally priyanka gets it and she got the vision of india and she goes back to india and there she gives it to her aunt who gives it to her daughter in that way it's a way of empowering Uh, women and they can see what they can do next in their lives so in that way she helped uh, her aunt as well as her daughter in india and uh, once she comes back to america she also learns some truths in india about her father that uh, her father had left her mother on the wedding day because her mother was pregnant with her and he was not ready to accept her so she did not know this truth but once she goes to india she comes to know about all these truths and then a beautiful relationship is also established between her and her mother which was not earlier when she had not gone to india and in the third uh, story that is naming maya uh, maya she also comes to india for the first time where uh, her mother has to sell her the house of her grandfather as he has passed away recently and um, again maya is very disturbed because of the divorce of her parents and she lives with her mother in new jersey and a very important character uh, in this particular novel is that of mami who is an old woman and who works as a cook in uh, maya's house and she had worked as a cook Uh, in various generations like with her grandmother with her mother so uh, she comes uh, to work as a cook and she develops a very beautiful relation with maya and uh, she has this problem of uh, mixing memories together uh, mami the mami mami the character she has this problem of mixing memories together and when she serves food she is reminded of world war 2 when uh, Uh, sugar was rationed all the disturbing memories come to the fore when she's doing some sort of work and she even uh, mistakes or she lives in a different world where she thinks maya to be her grandmother when she was young and she scolds her that i told you not to work uh, not to protest you oh, you will go to jail and these sort of things so maya is very confused about what is happening and finally she Uh, tries to help mummy with her memories uh, with her mixing up of memories and later she realizes maya realizes that it is the it is her way of living her life she mixes up memories to live her life and she has the right to choose her memories and maya then understands that in the in a similar manner she has the right to choose her memories her good memories she also comes to learn about the truth of her father and uh, her pa- paternal uh, grandparents where they did not support her mother and finally her mother had to leave her father and in that manner she establishes a very good relationship with her mother when she understands why her mother divorced her father and along with that she now tries to establish a good relation with her father as well by sending her some good uh, photographs uh, some good memories uh, from her trip to india so if we uh, look at all these three texts we come to some basic conclusions that all these three protagonists these female protagonists 
they come to India for the first time. They are aware of India through uh, some uh, summer uh, classes that they got uh, that they got uh, to know about India. They have learned about India through some classes uh, like Maya uh, Maya attends some summer culture cor uh, Indian course and. Um, Jazz has attended some English, uh, some Hindi classes. So through those classes, they have they know something about India. But once they physically travel to India, they learn things about themselves, their family, and they are able to resolve some basic issues that they were suffering through in their lives in a dif different country. They were not going through any kind of nostalgia for their country for their homeland neither were they uh, confused about their identity these are not the crisis that they were going through which is generally uh, we find in any diasporic text but here they were going through some basic crisis that every growing child goes through uh, insecurity issues regarding their bodies uh, their relationship with their parents, um, disturbing memories about their parents, their father, their mother, so such kind of issues that normally every child goes through probably in every country. So here what changes for them is this physical travel that, this, uh, that they undertake to India and the space of India and the people they meet in India, the friends that they make in India, were for a very short duration, changes their lives, changes their lives uh, spiritually, it transforms them psychologically and finally they go back to their to the country that they are living in a very transformed manner. So uh, that is why I named uh, the title as uh, Mapping India because they have come to India, they map India in their memories, in their growing up lives and then they go back in a very transformed manner they and uh, finally i would like to end with uh, some lines from uh, monsoon summer where fine jazz when she goes back uh, to america after this monsoon after the summer that she had uh, spent in india and things that she has taken back with her and that goes uh, true for all the three novels that I have covered here. And she says uh, about India that if I could bottle them and take them back with me, monsoon summer, I'd label the bottle and take a sip every now and then just to remember the taste. So the memories, the moments that they have spent in India in different places, monsoon summer is in Pune. Uh, Naming Maya is in Chennai and uh, Pashmina covers an area of Kolkata, Nagpur and Warangal, three cities. So in this manner, they are able to go back to their homeland for the first time, not missing their homeland or they don't even know that it's their homeland. But ultimately, it turns to be a space for them which transforms them forever in their lives. And they go back to their country happy and um, spiritually, physically, psychologically transformed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kanupriya, for your paper and uh, the stories about the Indian diaspora that you uh, talked about in your paper. So there are several revelations that you have made. That is how the children uh, and previously, you know, they had uh, their uh, some kind of taboos. Uh, they have had not really uh, wanted to visit their homeland. But now, once uh, where they think of traveling uh, to their homeland, and then their how their lives are sort of spiritually transformed, how that becomes some kind of en enriching experience for them. So, such an interesting paper, Kanupriya. So. Uh, now we uh, sort of uh, will be open for questions for the entire session. So the questions that can be typed in the chat box. Uh, no, Rakhidi, actually, this is the private chat. This is yes, uh, only yes. visible for us. Uh, 
uh, only people from the social media like Facebook or YouTube, if they are commenting, then we can have those uh, questions. Yes, yes. If there are questions from there, please, of course. Yes, yes. Uh, otherwise, I think Rakiri, you and I will definitely yes, have yes, I know. A few I'm, questions. I know. No, no. I'm definitely referring to the questions that people from social media may have. So if yes. we could uh, sort of. Yes, let's see if there is any. Questions for Kathleen's paper, for Doita's paper, and for Kanukriya's paper from the Facebook page. There is no comment yet. Okay. Okay, in that case, uh, I would like to ask a question to Kathleen. Uh, that is, uh, Kathleen, regarding the first book that you referred to, that was in red. So, uh, could you explain anything about that color red that is used over there? So, has that color red got any kind of political overtones? Of course, it has loads of political overtones and then symbolical um, undertones as well. Uh, in particular, I think that's a very attractive color for any children. Uh, it's very striking, it's very spectacular, uh, it's something that you spot immediately. So uh, commercially it's a good choice. The other reason was the, the homophone, the riddle which I mentioned in the title. And the third, what you are asking about is more the political undertones which are of course there. Uh, red is the, the color associated with, with communism, with uh, the Soviet bloc, uh, which is a substantial part of, of Sirtis' um, experience. And actually, red is one of the three colors of the Hungarian flag as well, the top color. So uh, it might be lurking uh, behind the book, but I didn't feel that that color uh, or these political undertones of the color uh, would appear on any part of the textual level. So they might be there, but I, I didn't find any explicit references to that. I did find uh, some of those undertones rather in the land of the giants in the, the middle book, but, but that has nothing to do with that. In color there, uh, both the, the cover and the drawings are, are either in black and white or in a mild uh, gray. Okay, okay, thanks, Becky. May I also ask a question now I have the word? Uh, to the second presentation. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure, sure. Sure. Okay, uh, just I found this uh, uh, presentation by uh, um, uh, Dwight, sorry, sorry if I mispronounce her name. Dwight, yes. Dwight, uh, about boarding schools, very exciting. And uh, and I think many of the points that she made were, were absolutely relevant and, and inspiring. And I was just just couldn't help thinking about our schooling system and, and the reading of our students of such narratives. Now, the situation in Hungary is that we don't really have boarding schools, especially for young children. The youngest you can enter boarding school is, I think, 14. And in the English system, it's a bit lower. So I was wondering, uh, and then what I thought that uh, for Hungarian readers, it's much easier to think about a boarding school as a metaphorical place because they don't have it in reality. It's clear from the beginning that it's, it's something in fantasy world or a distant place or a metaphorical world. And I was just wondering if in the Indian school system you have this distinction or is it just boarding schools so popular and widespread that they, they experience it like realism and whether you have boarding school uh, narratives and also other school narratives in Indian in such a large number or it's it's more English dominant so if it's a long question no uh, that's a, that's a uh, actually a very interesting question because um, I have uh, it's just very uh, you know slightly touched upon because of the constraint of times um, as I said that boarding school in itself is a concept that is not very um, common, not even in England, you know, when um, uh, in the early, um, in the second half of the 18th century, when the boarding school stories uh, were being written, you know, the school stories were, um, you know, were coming up. Uh, interestingly, even then, boarding schools were very few, and it was only for the elites 
Right. And it's been the case always, uh, in, not only in England, interestingly, but uh, in most parts of the world, uh, you know, uh, generally, uh, most other school, uh, kids go to a day school. Um, even in India, we do not have, uh, you know, uh, boarding schools are not, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, I wouldn't say uh, that they're, they, they're non-existent or they're um, not popular, but they are there. But mostly, um, uh, how we would see if we, uh, you know, how, um, it, it is more for the elite uh, and uh, not for everyone. So um, the idea uh, of the boarding school for young readers is always somewhat uh, fantasy ridden, uh, perhaps. Even in England, actually, because uh, the readers, the young readers who were reading, um, you know, uh, because when uh, the, the early um, um, boarding school stories, the school stories uh, were being written, they were separately written for the boys, because the boys, um, you know, uh, the, the boys boarding school, and uh, for the girls. Uh, who would go to a small uh, 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 boarding, boarding school uh, which would accommodate like 10 girls and it was more like a, a home ambience and uh, you know they would be uh, kind of taught about the domestic duties or perhaps uh, you know uh, kind of being taught about uh, what they would be doing as they would move into the domestic space um, you know gradually uh, and even that was kind of only available to the elite class in England, uh, so not, and yet uh, all the other kids who were reading perhaps the books, or even like when uh, you know anybody else reading the books, did not have a boarding school experience personally, perhaps. So it is always um, kind of uh, somewhat uh, fantastical for everyone anywhere, um, even in India as well. Um, I, I uh, could I answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. I, I think it's, it's really interesting, the social background to our metaphorical readings. Um, no, and uh, actually, I was kind of, I, I actually found your uh, paper very interesting. And, uh, the, the, uh, you know, uh, the idea of uh, in the land of giant, the giant, you know, the, the adult and the power uh, that comes with, you know, adulthood. Uh, is something what my paper talks about. So I was kind of, um, you know, trying to find a connection uh, in the land of the giant. And then again, the next book is How to Become a Tiger. Um, somewhere again, it is about, uh, you know, because tiger is symbolic of, you know, uh, the, you know, uh, attaining power, some, becoming powerful. So to the child, how to become a tiger? I, I don't know the contents, but from the name itself, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, it intrigued me, and I'm going to definitely look up. Um, it kind of intrigued me that perhaps it is to, again, uh, uh, initiate the child into, uh, you know, the power struggles and that you need to be, um, you know, uh, you kind of need to have an agency of your own, uh, you know, and uh, have to be powerful in some way. So it is kind of initiating them into that, um, that adulthood is about being the giant, uh, towering over the others uh, somewhere, somewhat, or becoming the tiger, uh, you know, kind of, uh, again, um, uh, being more stronger and more powerful uh, than the others. Somewhat, uh, it is kind of initiating the kids the, the little kids into into the power struggle at a very early age, uh, perhaps, and it can be seen from uh, various angles. Uh, being the refugee uh, in a different country, also he he perhaps realized that uh, you know uh, the power uh, and the agency is very much important. Uh, you know to assert one's identity or uh, you know, chalk one's identity. Um, so, I absolutely agree with you, and thank you very much for pointing out this parallel. Uh, the entire book is about growing up and and uh, empowering the child, teaching yes. the child how to control his or her body and then his or her movement, and then how to adopt various social roles and how to gain that that kind of courage that one needs for life. And that particular poem is about playfully teaching the child how to imitate a tiger, like like crawling. On, on the carpet and how to roll like a, uh, a tiger. So I, I do think that it's very much in parallel with, with what you were speaking about or saying about uh, 
preparing the child through the school system, through navigating those social connections uh, <laughs> into the challenges of, of adult life. And uh, the the other thing I wanted to just really just one uh, sentence about the third presentation. Once again, I'm very sorry about mispronouncing names. Kind of Priya's presentation. Uh, I, I also liked it very much, although uh, that was a bit uh, more challenging for me to connect to because those experiences she was reflecting on and the ones I was reflecting on were, were kind of very different. But but I think uh, it's really important that she pointed out the. Um, the plurality of multicultural experiences, that it's not just multicultural experience is something that's complex or challenging, but the, the, there are sophisticated differences between these, these various situations when you are a refugee, when you are adopted, when you grow up in one place and then move to the other, all the other way around. So I, I really appreciated her analysis of, of these, these uh, um, subtle uh, uh, nuances and differences uh, in each and every narrative that she referred to. I just wanted to say thank you for that. Well, Doitadi, I have another question for you. This is on the same line that uh, you have just ended, uh, that you have said that uh, boarding schools are so rare or uh, as much as it is adulated or appreciated or as many numbers it, it can be found in books and fictions it is not so uh, easily visible or you know these are not very rampant uh, in even britain uh, forget about india uh, so uh, i was i was talk i'm talking about particularly in the context of harry potter because uh, harry potter is probably the first uh, boarding school text which uh, very consciously uh, breaks down this uh, narrative of uh, elitist uh, idea, elitist structure of a boarding school. Uh, so my question is, since you have also brought uh, Althusser's idea of uh, how the subjectivity is being molded from a very young age, uh, would you say that uh, from that context that uh, these boarding schools are shaping only uh, the elitist minds and uh, if we are not thinking of Harry Potter as an exception, the other boarding school narratives, these are only shaping a very particular class-based uh, narrative, class-based education to these uh, children. Would you say that the subjectivity is being molded by the class system as well? Uh, <clears throat> that is a very interesting question, actually. Yes. Um, uh, you know, as I, as I said, the, the paper is in progress, so I am I, I myself exploring uh, more and more about uh, this. But actually, uh, what I came across is that uh, the early boarding school stories actually were, uh, you know, very, um, uh, you know, had a, a, a certain um, um, uh, class um, um, approach to classes, uh, as an uh, elitist approach to it. Yeah. And uh, uh, Even in reality, too, in India, if we can think of it, is doom school is always about the prime ministers, their kids, and all those people who just. Yes. I have heard this that they will come out. Even if it's today, it's valid that uh, I have heard this probably in one of those podcasts that uh, students go to go outside India just to get that you know that peers section, that interesting peers section, not really about the education so it's very interesting when you think about it that the boarding schools give you the peers and that background that prestigious uh, background uh, instead of really uh, the absolutely, prestigious ab education. Ab absolutely uh, and um, uh, in the early um, you know prior to second world war actually it was a uh, very elitist the uh, the boarding school stories because they were also single gendered uh, boarding school stories um, you know, single sex uh, uh, boarding school stories. They were they were a kind of parallelly the boys uh, school stories and the girls school stories were, uh, you know, uh, developing parallelly. And um, uh, as I said that uh, 
uh, the boys school was all about uh, character building and uh, you know uh, uh, bearing the torch of imperial glory and uh, all such uh, things and obviously all of this is expected from uh, you know the public school uh, uh, public schools of england uh, and in fact um, i i think i have in my uh, presentation where uh, george orwell he actually talks about uh, this uh, i'll just share uh, i i'm just so sorry because i had that quote uh, uh, you know um, of uh, george orwell i just uh, deliberately put it because i could not uh, talk about it uh, uh, because of the lack of time i had just uh, put it there so if you can see in his essay boys is weekly first published in 1940 george orwell suggested that the school story is peculiar to england because in england education is mainly a matter of status so um as as i uh, as you pointed out uh, you know uh, orwell himself attests the fact that it was actually very um, uh, you know it was very class uh, you know uh, uh, very uh, class bound yes but post second world war slowly um, actually it was kind of uh, getting um, you know it was moving from single gender uh, single sex stories to uh, the the borders were becoming mixed gender and they started kind of also including um, you know um, people from uh, you know children from all the sections so all you, other you, uh, backgrounds all other backgrounds so uh, you have uh, like uh, eric krasner's the flying classroom um, um, where uh, you have uh, you know uh, this mixed bunch of boys uh, you know so one of them is an orphan uh, the other one is uh, very rich uh, the uh, another one is very poor Uh, comes from a very poor background so then it, it is uh, you know uh, from uh, i would say post uh, first world war uh, actually um, uh, it kind of starts uh, getting slowly you know you have uh, mixed uh, background uh, kids coming yes. together in the in the uh, uh, bo boarding school so that way so in conclusion of... you would you would say that the boarding school narratives are not really producing the homogeneous uh, that homogeneity that uh, immediately it uh, we we think of it if we if we think about elitist structure of the schools then the boarding school narratives are coming out of that uh, expectation so they are and as you said as you yourself pointed out that harry potter uh, you know yes. uh, majorly kind of uh, you know uh breaks took a stance to kind of breaking down this <clears throat> very elitist uh, approach uh, actually so yeah. <coughs> i'm so sorry but um yeah it, you, you had a uh, that, that was a very uh, uh, and uh, and um, point another thing that i want to mention that is if you are thinking of the present day context even nowadays that is there are schools run by the ramkrishna mission you see those are also boarding schools for very poor children so uh, maybe actually because ramkrishna mission is a uh, an institution that is solely caters to men boys and not women so Absolutely. there are Absolutely. so many boarding schools for young boys who are poor so they are uh, staying there almost free of cost so many of them are orphans so such kinds of boarding schools are to be seen in the present day context so yes but uh, you know rakhidi i was thinking of in terms of fiction whenever we no, think no, of no no i am not talking about fiction yes 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 i am not yes. talking yes. about any such kind of fiction uh, you know they have not come out as um, you know stories but if you see dickens Uh, yes, know, in yes, David Copperfield. Uh, yes, itself. I am. I am just thinking about the system. I am not thinking about any narrative. Yes. I am just. No, as, as you pointed out yes. again, interestingly, uh, nothing has been written even in 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 yes, our literature yes. as well. Uh, yes, yes, nothing yes. has been written, uh, you know, because the, there is a prospect to write about the, these boarding school definitely, stories. Definitely, uh, definitely. Uh, but. Uh, nothing has been this uh, multiplicity uh, of voices do not get reflected that no, in no. that way uh, so yes so, so in that way uh, the spaces, 
yes in that way those spaces indeed become fantastical realm because yes the structure with which it comes up with that imposing structures that almost like that not almost exactly gothic buildings uh, that you yes. have here and uh, it imposes the idea that where you belong that doitadi has said that uh, it it try to tries to inculcate that this is the place you belong this is your identity now with which it is bounded with this uh, also the class identity that it it is imposing that yeah. uh, the class identity so since you belong Absolutely. to this uh, educational institute you, you somehow belongs to this uh, class identity as well so yes uh, so many things are you know Just tied up and uh, entangled, and yeah, and just thanks to uh, all of you for your questions. Because as I said, my paper is in progress, so um, is a work in progress. So I, I definitely, or uh, you know, these reflections will uh, help me kind of uh, build the case uh, better now. I have also uh, a question for Kanu Priya. Yes, 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 definitely. I have a very generic question for her. Uh, that is, uh, what? Uh, would you would you kindly define what did you mean by psycho uh, physical uh, because when we think about travel it you know it it kind of makes me think that i am traveling physically but it is also making some impact on my mind so psychologically and physically both of them are kind of a club uh, some way in my experience of a travel so uh, what special emphasis you are putting on in this term actually uh yeah thank you thank you for the question uh here i am emphasizing because uh, firstly we are dealing with diasporic texts okay so uh, when we talk about diasporic texts space becomes extremely important so in that term uh, physical space is extremely important but uh, i am focusing again along with physical i'm focusing on psychological because the transformation that these protagonists undergo once they travel physically and then they come back the way they have started their lives living their lives after coming back from that physical space the transformation in their minds that it has taken definitely when you travel somewhere Uh, you will grasp something psychologically but the transformation that i am talking about i wanted to stress on that that is why i uh, purposely put this word uh, psycho and physical both may i ask a question from you as well yes. um any of presentation which i i uh, enjoyed a lot uh, you were mostly speaking about transformations that are related to to traveling and and covering these gaps between places and and regaining in identity and you were reflecting on on three narratives in specific but i'm quite sure that you have read loads of these narratives for choosing these three so what i would be interested in is not just based on these three but the others that you have read as well is there a significant difference in these identity stories and transformation stories related to gender or it's it's it appears mostly the same processes for any of these protagonists or narrators uh, from india ending up in different places independently whether they are boys or girls uh so basically the texts that i have covered and apart from this that uh, the texts that i have read there's another one uh, take me back take me back this is again from mitali perkins and there uh, the protagonist is a male a, a, a boy who is again an orphan and he has been adopted from an indian uh, orphanage and he is very curious to know about his ancestors about his parents and everything and he goes back to india but he does not get to know anything about his uh, parents or his life but he comes back with that conclusion that some things cannot you cannot go back in life but you have to move forward so uh, i the text that i chose these protagonists are definitely female uh, females and their transformations but yes there are various texts where even the male genders they undergo the similar kind of transformations and i have basically picked up uh, the indian diasporic texts so for that i can talk about so a similar kind of transformation uh, in other uh, texts as well has been talked about 
Thank you. Okay, so are there any more questions from social media? No, I think I do not see it yet. Oh, no, no. Show Modi is saying there's no question. There is no question. So uh, maybe we have come to the end of this session and uh, it was such an enlightening and enriching session. Thanks to all the speakers for sharing their ideas with us and hope to see you again another time. Thanks a lot for attending the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all.